right, you have opened up now the fourth video in our chapter called The Heart of Chemistry, which is focusing on the mole and stoichiometry. We are moving into reaction stoichiometry, and man, you rocked at this. We're going to add a little bit more of a, of a depth to it for AP Chemistry, but you did so well in pre-AP Chemistry, and general, I'm sure you did as well. And if not, you need to come see me on this if you came up from general chemistry so I can give you a little bit of one-on-one uh, -on -one tutoring to, to bring you up to where we want to be to fully grasp the AP level. Now, if you remember this, we're going to use what we call, and I don't know where this ever came from, but we started calling this years ago the magic mole ratio. And remember that you always want to show this. Well, I'll, I'll refresh your memory as we go. Uh, but when we do, even if it's a one-to-one -one ratio, you need to be showing that you understood that that ratio was present. Now, we'll do that, and if you were in my class, or maybe some of the others, we talked about the mole road. And so our real goal on this is to convert anything we're given to moles. So we need to find out what process we need to do to do that. Now let's talk a little bit about stoichiometry reactions. Now in a stoichiometry reaction, again we're going to use that mole ratio. Now the mole ratio is given by the balancing coefficients. So you have to start with a balanced equation and we'll use those balancing coefficients to move from one species to another species in the reaction, as long as we are at the mole level. Now, with stoichiometry calculation, reactions are assumed, note that key point there, reactions are assumed to proceed 100% to the given product without the formation of any byproducts. So when we do these, we're always going to use a single arrow and that single arrow is going to imply 100%. Now, a main unit in AP Chemistry deals with reversible reactions called equilibria, and those reactions go something less than 100%. I mean, could be way less than 100%. Now, some people think we have to go product to reactant or reactant to product. Reactant to product is common. But there's no reason why you can't go back from product to reactant. If you need to make a certain amount of product to make the amount of money that you need to break even at least, so you're finding your minimum amount of money to make on that product that would account for all of your costs, in, including human resources, you may go backwards and figure out, okay, how much reactant am I going to need to purchase to do this? So this is a very much a practical application in real life. Now, you may also have to go from reactant to reactant. Maybe one of your reactants costs quite a bit of money and you want to make sure you use it all up. Sorry about that. You want to make sure that you use it all up and so we can calculate how much of the cheaper, what's the minimum amount of the cheaper reactant that we'll use so we fully maximize this uh, expensive reactant so that we can fully use that amount of money that we have spent. So there's no magic in terms of which direction that we're going to be moving in these reactions. Now, let's take a look. If two reactants are given, okay, if two or more, really, so we could have or more, but I would probably not to see too many like that. If two or more reactant amounts are given, we call this a limiting reactant or reagent problem. And the process is the same, it's just a little bit more work to get to the final answer. Now, if you see only one reactant and that another is in excess, uh, if it's in excess, you don't have to worry at all about that substance because there's plenty there, it's not gonna run out. Now, when we talk about the amount of product that we can calculate here, what that is going to represent is the maximum we would get 
assuming again that it went 100% and that there were no side reactions, that it all went to the desired product. That's why it's the maximum. We also call that, call that the theoretical yield for the reaction. The percent yield is one of the many percents we're going to be calculating a little bit later on. And you notice that the theoretical yield is in the denominator. That theoretical yield will always be our link to our stoichiometry in or out of a stoichiometry calculation. Your experimental yield will either be given, sometimes it's called the actual, what somebody actually was able to obtain in the lab. So actual or actually, and it's given, or it would be your final value that you're calculating. In other words, that number will not go in to a stoichiometry. So we're not going to be substituting this in and out of our stoichiometry. Now, let's go on and let me walk through one of these that I have worked out for you. I want you to learn, it's a very good skill to learn, how to evaluate a problem that's already been laid out for you. Because of course, that's how you see them in textbooks. Now, many textbooks are starting to include tutorials among their resources, and then you can see a problem worked out. But you still often need to look at an answer, a fully worked out problem, and see where the values came from. Now, in this example, we have the thermite reaction. The goal is to make molten iron, and hopefully we can get Mr. Coder to do that for us. And you notice right here, we have our given. Now, what I like to do, and it doesn't matter if you reverse this, Ms. Marusik has this flipped differently. I like to put the moles right underneath the reaction because I know that's the only way that I can travel along a reaction is via moles. And then I put all other units below. And I also want you to notice that I have lined them up so that the values are underneath the substances that we're discussing. Now, if you will map out your problem this way, you're much less likely to get lost. Now, this question actually had two components to it. One question said, how much iron three oxide would I need to form 15 grams of my iron liquid? And it also asks, well, how much aluminum oxide would also form? Now, this amount was given as excess, so we don't even have to worry about aluminum for the rest of the problem. So let's take a look at our first one. Key here is we want to get to the mole road Mass to moles, use molar mass. And that's what we did here. We started with our mass, and then we used our molar mass of iron. And that's actually the first step for both directions. Now, for the first problem, what we want is to move from moles of iron to moles of iron three oxide. And that's where we use the magic mole ratio, the coefficients. It's always where you're going to, and that's an implied one, over where you're coming from. And we're going to iron two oxide. Now, a better way to do it is to set it up. So units cancel, I have moles of iron, I want to eliminate moles of iron, I want moles of iron three oxide, and now I look in front of the iron three and I have a one, I look in front of the iron and I have a two. So if you set it up by unit analysis, you will also get the answer that you're after there. Now, then we need to go from mass down to, excuse me, from moles down to mass. And we're talking about our iron three oxide. And so mass to moles, use molar mass. We want moles of iron to cancel. We want mass, so we put it in the numerator. And when we do that calculation to three fig sig figs, we should have 21.4 grams of that iron three oxide. Now let's take a look at the other direction. This time we're going moles to moles 
of the aluminum oxide. So we want moles of iron to cancel. We want to end up in this step with moles of aluminum oxide. There's an implied one there, and there's a clear two there, so that's where I got that one over two. And if you forget, it's always where you're going to on the front end of the arrow over where you're coming from on the back end of your arrow. Mass to moles, use molar mass. So that's my molar mass of aluminum oxide, two aluminums, three oxygens. Perform my math and I get one 13.7 grams of aluminum oxide. Now the question that is in your notes, I, I didn't put it here for uh, sake of space, but the question in your notes indicated that it's known that this reaction can typically provide for us a 93% yield. So the question is, how much would we actually get? If we perform this reaction and the uh, ability of the reaction to produce product is in the range of 93%, how much can we expect to get? So the 13.7 is our theoretical yield. The theoretical yield is our link in and out of a stoichiometry. Sometimes you'll have to go into a stoichiometry. Sometimes you're coming out of a stoichiometry. Plug that in. Our mass of aluminum oxide is our unknown. And when we solve for that, we find that even though we had hoped to get 13.7 grams, we're much more likely to get 12.7 grams. So that is our introduction to reaction stoichiometry. We want to go on in the next video clip and actually work some of these. And as much as you can work ahead on eight and nine and 10, that will be better because you can see whether or not you understand the concepts that we're after. And I'm going to go ahead and do three of them because they each have a little bit of a variation on this stoichiometry theme.